we've been going through uh, various classes on Leviticus, and we're doing today the fifth one on principles of priesthood. And uh, we're only doing one this six months, and so then we'll conclude, God willing, next year with Day of Atonement and Jubilee and Liberty. So we're going to talk about the principles of priesthood. Now let's look at, we have a bit of a, a Hebrew lesson here about priests. Now the Hebrew word for priest is Kohen, uh, which means one who officiates. Now you probably know there's many Jews, they've got a surname of Kohen. Um, perhaps that means they were descendants of Aaron's family, we, we don't know. But you can see here the different uh names there for priests. So there's priest, which means Cohen. The high priest is Cohen Gadol. The chief priest, which is the same as a high priest really, but it's slightly different. It's called Cohen Harosh. And you can see there probably the Hebrew, the word Rosh there, which means chief. And anointed priest, which is Cohen Messiah. And that um, could mean anointed priest could either mean the high priest or one of his sons, one of the other priests as well. So let's go back to the beginning about the purpose of God with uh, with Israel. And we've got there in Exodus 19, verses 5 to 6, God's purpose with Israel, and where it says there, Now therefore, if ye, that is Israel, will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. So when God called Israel out of Egypt, he had a purpose with them. And the purpose is outlined in those verses, to be a kingdom of priests and to bring the surrounding nations, the Gentiles, to God. Now let's have a look. If you've got your Bible open, we might just turn to Deuteronomy um, chapter 4. We're going to read a few verses there, which also shows how Israel were to be an example to other nations. So we just turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and I'm going to read verses 5 to 8. I'll read that if I can find it. Okay, Deuteronomy 4, verse, verses 5 to 8. And it says, Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as Yahweh my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people for what great nation is there that has god so near to it as yahweh our god is to us and whatever reason we may call upon him and what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are all in this law which i set before you this day so we see here that israel was to be an example to the Gentile nations. The other nations were to marvel at the laws which God gave them, and hopefully these other nations will see that they're wonderful laws which came from God and be drawn um, to Israel by the not only by the laws, by but also by how Israel behaved, hopefully according to those words. But that didn't always work out, did it, with the nation of Israel, because they became, they actually learned wickedness and idolatry from other nations and went astray a lot of, on a lot, of, a lot of occasions. So let's have a look now at the, some of the principles of priesthood. And we've got six principles which we're going to look at. The first one is holiness. And we'll just read those two um, verses we've got on the screen there. In Leviticus 21, verse 6, which we read today, it says, They shall be holy, that is, a priest, unto their God, and not profane the name of their God, for the offerings of Yahweh made by fire and the bread of their God they do offer, therefore they shall be holy. And also Leviticus 10 verse 10 says, that ye may put a difference between holy and holy, between unclean and clean. So this is what was required of the priests. So holiness basically means separated to God's surface. And it also means being able to tell the difference between unclean and clean. Or in other words, to be able to tell the difference between good and evil. Now, this is very important because we live in a in our modern age and most of the Western world teaches that uh, the philosophy of 
postmodernism, which basically teaches there's no no such thing as absolute right and wrong. As long as you you are okay with it, then it must be right. But God tells us that there is right and wrong, and he tells us what it is, and he tells us through his word, the Bible. So to be holy means reading the Bible and understanding what it teaches concerning God's morals. Only the Bible can teach us and give us the, up, the ability to be holy and to be separate and set apart from the unholiness that is in the world. Now, the principle of holiness was also shown in the crown that the uh, high priest had to wear, and that's shown there in, um, in Exodus 39, verse 30, which we've got on the screen, which says, And they shall make the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote upon it a writing like to the engraving of a signet, holiness to Yahweh. So that's what the high priest had to have on his forehead to have that crown which said holiness to Yahweh. And that was there on his forehead to remind him and to remind the people that, that what, that's what he was to, to be like. He had to be thinking, because it was on his forehead, he, he emphasised that he should be um, thinking like God thinks. He should have godly thinking at all times. And the lesson is also for us that that's what we need to do. We need to have godly thinking and show that in, in, in our lives, in what we do and what we act and what we think about. Now, the second principle is about not being defiled with corruption and death. Now, we read in that chapter certain verses about the laws, how the priests and the sons of the priests had certain restrictions uh, concerning dealing with dead people or dead relatives. So there's restrictions on the sons of the high priests which we've got there on the screen in Leviticus 21, verses 1 to 3, where it says that Yahweh said to Moses, Speak unto the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say unto them, They shall none be defiled for the dead among his people, but for his king that is near unto him, that is for his mother and for his father, for his son, for his daughter, for his brother, and for his sister, a virgin, that is nigh unto him, which hath no husband, for her he may be defiled. So the high sons of the high priest were restricted in who they could, how they could be defiled with dead bodies. They could only be defiled or go to, like for example, going to a funeral of only close family uh, members when they died. And, and some of them are listed there, aren't they? That these are the sons of the high priest. They could they could go for their father's funeral, the mother's funeral, their their son, the daughter, their sister, etc. They they were allowed uh, to go there, but they were very restricted. They couldn't go to anybody else's funeral. But when we come to the high priest, he was even further restricted um, about uh, being defiled with the dead or whose funeral he can go to. And we've got there the verse in um, Leviticus 21, verse 10. It says, So the high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated to put on the garment, shall not uncover his head, nor rent his clothes. Neither shall he go into any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. So the high priest had the greatest restriction. He could not be associated with death and mourning at all. He could not mourn or go to the funeral, even of his father and his mother. And that's because he represented the immortal God. Therefore, he could not be associated with corruption and death. And we, we note also that Jesus Christ became our high priest, not when he was a mortal man, but when he was raised and made immortal, that's when he became our high priest, when he was free from the dominion of mortality. So the high priest is a type of God, and it's a type of the immortal Lord Jesus Christ. There's another important principle here, again, which shows that the high priest had to put service to God before family. So even if his father or mother died, he had to put God first and he couldn't go to their funerals. And we see this again, a principle found with not only with the uh, priestly family, but also with the Levites. Now, Deuteronomy 10 verse 8 tells us what the duty of the Levites were. It says there, and that time Yahweh separated the tribe of 
Levi, to bear the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, to stand before Yahweh, to minister unto him and to bless his name unto his day. Now, the high priest, of course, came from the tribe of Levi also. But you see here what they had to do. They were separated. They were to bear, to stand, to minister and to bless God's name. And the Levites were renowned for being for putting God before their family. And we see this in Leviticus, sorry, in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 8, where it says there, and of Levi he said, Let the, thy thummim and thy urim um, be with thy holy one, whom thou did prove at Massa, and with whom thou did strive at the waters of Meribah, who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word and kept thy covenant. So here we see again the Levites were putting God or God's word before family. And that's an important principle even for us because um, the Lord Jesus Christ said a similar thing in the New Testament. We're not going to turn to this, but I'll just quote from um, Luke chapter 14, verse 26. And Jesus said then, if any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So even Jesus said about his disciples that we have to put God um, and Christ before, before family. Now let's look at why death is God's enemy. And in Romans 5, verse 12, it really tells us this. In, in that verse, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all that have sinned. So why does God have a problem with death? Because death came as a consequence of sin. Sin and death are closely related though, as cause and effect. And 1 Corinthians 15 tells us how death is God's enemy. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, 26, which talks about the end of the millennium, it says, Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he, that is Jesus, must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So it's interesting here, death is called the last enemy. Now, why is that? Why isn't sin the last enemy? Well, that's because sin must be removed first. Once sin is removed, then you can get rid of the effect, which is death, finally. So once all sin is removed from the world, then all death will be removed as well, which, and death was a consequence of sin. And as Revelation uh, 20 verse 14 says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Now, the other principle about um, immortality is that we need to live, as it were, an immortal life now. We've got here a couple of quotes from John's gospel, from words that Jesus Christ said. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And also John 6, verse 54, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, we have eternal immortal life in a spiritual sense we we should be living as though we're immortals as we, although as though we are already in the kingdom and note the paradox in the first quote there jesus said that whosoever believes on him has everlasting life now but we know that we are not immortal but really jesus is saying we've got a guarantee of immortality and also note that the last quote there in John 6, verse 54, he's talking about eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood. He says he has eternal life, but 
But then he goes on to say, I will raise him up on the last day. So he's actually saying, you, I will raise him up. You're still going to die, possibly, if Christ, if we die before Christ's return. And then, though, we will be raised and given eternal life. So as long as we are in Christ, we have that promise or that guarantee of eternal life. And as we said, we need to live an immortal life now, as it were, and Paul tells us about this principle in Romans 6, verse uh, 3 and 4, which I'll just read out now. He said, Know ye not that as many of you of us as we baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. So we need to walk, as it's a, as Paul says, in newness of life, as if we are already been resurrected and given immortality. That's the principle that we should try to live by. Okay, now we come to the third principle, which is the spotless bride. And again, we in the reading we read today about the priest in Leviticus 21, verses 13 and 14, it tells us about what kind of wife the priest had to marry it says there and he shall take a wife in her virginity a widow or a divorced woman or a profane or a harlot these shall he not take but he shall take a virgin of his own people to wife so as a high priest as we said is a representative of god or representative of christ so is his bride she must be pure and chaste and one who loves god this is an important principle even in our marriages because we know that the scriptures emphasize that we are only to marry in the truth. In that way, the married couple can jointly help each other in their walk towards the kingdom and also help in nurturing their children in godly ways. And we know, of course, there's that great type in the scripture that in the bride represents the body of Christ, it represents the ecclesia, which is us, and Christ is our bridegroom. And the role of the um, of the bridegroom or, or husbands of Christ, his talk mentions here these uh, they are to wash the be wash their bride with the word. So we'll just read this read the the quote we've got on the screen from Ephesians five verses twenty five to twenty seven where it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the ecclesia and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious ecclesia, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So Jesus Christ, as the bridegroom, he wants the ecclesia to be washed by the scriptures, hopefully on a daily basis because we are surrounded by an unclean world and its philosophies and by our own failing sinful nature. We need a constant application of Bible of the Bible on a daily basis to keep us spiritually clean. And so when our Lord returns, he's looking for a bride without spot or blemish. And we know, unfortunately, from history that the early ecclesia did not remain pure and chaste and slowly became corruption, corrupted with false doctrine and changed into the harlot at Christian churches of today. So how did it happen? Well, it occurred because the, those, the ecclesia started turning away from the teachings of Scripture. And so we've got to beware and prepare and read the Bible constantly. As the Apostle Paul says, he was trying to keep the bride a chaste and spotless for her husband, which is Christ. And he tells us this in, um, I've got the wrong reference, that's actually 2 Corinthians, I thought I'd fix that. It's 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 to 3, where Paul says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I pre might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any man's, any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity in, that is in Christ. So the Apostle Paul even saw it during his time when he was preaching the word that 
the ecclesia was being bombarded with false doctrine by Judaizers, by false apostles, and he was trying his best to keep the ecclesia as a spotless bride and not corrupted um, as a serpent corrupted Eve. And we know, as we said, unfortunately, over time, there was a change to the ecclesia. It was a chaste virgin it started off with in the first century. And as Revelation then tells us, it became corrupted. It became a pregnant bride. Revelation 12 tells us this. And finally, in Revelation 17, it becomes a harlot. And, and what's unfortunate about that is that that harlot Christian system, which came from the Ecclesia, will be fighting against Christ and the saints at Christ's return. That's how bad they've got that once when Christ returns, they will mistake so much of Christianity today will mistake Christ and the saints as the Antichrist system. And again, this is because they turned away from the true doctrine that was found in the Bible. So we need to make ourselves ready to be prepared as a spotless bride waiting the master's return. Okay, the, the first the, the fourth principle is to be I've got there physically or morally perfect. Now, when we read those um, verses, I probably won't read them again. You can see them on the screen um, from Leviticus 21, verses 17 to 21. It shows that for the high priest and for the priests, they had to be physically perfect. They couldn't have any blemishes or any problems like being blind or lame, um, broken-footed, etc., or eunuchs or whatever it was. They had to be physically perfect without any ble physical blemishes. So what is God's lesson that he's trying to teach us here? Is God trying to teach us he's only interested in people that are physically perfect and have no disabilities? Well, that's not, not the case. What it's really showing is that the high priest must be morally perfect. The physical perfection of is a pointer to what was really important in God's eyes, a morally um, perfect character. The outward physical perfection of the high priest, which the people could see, was supposed to reveal what he was really like inside, which a person could not see. Now, such principles are also found in uh, other rituals in the law. For example, um, we know in the rite of circumcision, um, physical circumcision, which literally involves a cutting off of a piece of flesh, was really to point forward to what a person had to do morally in his life, that is to cut off fleshly thoughts and motives from his or her life, those things which bring forth sin. So these are lessons to teach them what they were to do in a moral sense. And so we need to also aim to be morally perfect, even though we won't achieve it in this side of the kingdom. But remember what the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, who said in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 48, he said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So while we can't be perfect, that's what we have to aim. We have to aim for the best. God and Christ wants us to aim to be as best as we can, to be like God and to be like Christ. Now, let's just have a look at um, some phys physical, uh, physically per perfect priests who were morally corrupt. corrupt. So as we said, these were priests who we might say, well, they were physically okay, but they didn't exhibit the moral characteristics that God wanted to, to show. So we, we looked at an earlier class, our first class, Nadab and Abihu, who were the sons of Aaron. They offered strange fire. They were drunk, and therefore God... Uh, put them to death. And throughout Scripture, we've also got Hophni and Phinehas in the times of um, of Samuel, the prophet, when he was young. They were immoral. They robbed God in offerings. We've got Abiathar, who lived in the time of David and Solomon, and he conspired against Solomon. Uriah, another high priest, who replaced uh, an altar with an Assyrian one on the orders of King Ahaz, who was Hezekiah's father. Sarah, he was wicked, a wicked high priest. He was the last high priest um, before the 
fall of the kingdom of Judah, and he was killed by Nebuchadnezzar. And then we've got Eliashib. Uh, he had an allegiance with Sam, Balat, and Tobiah. So we can see in the Old Testament there were lots of high priests <clears throat> who were physically perfect but did not exhibit moral perfection. Um, and so they were really failures. And, of course, then we've got the New Testament, haven't we? New Testament, we've got priests like Annas and Caiaphas who killed Christ and were completely corrupt uh, as well. And so these were priests that didn't exhibit those moral characteristics that God wanted them uh, to, to show. Now, physical defects didn't mean uh, disfellowship. We've got there in the verses in Leviticus um, 21, verses 21 to 23 on the screen, it says there that no man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron the priest shall come nigh to offer offerings of Yahweh made by fire. He hath a blemish. He shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God, but he shall eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy and the holy. Only he shall not go into the veil, nor come nigh unto the altar, because he has a blemish, that he profane not my sanctuaries, for I, Yahweh, do sanctify them. So it would appear that although if you were one of the descendants of Aaron and you had a physical, physical blemish that you couldn't be a priest, you, you couldn't be a priest, but you could still eat the bread of his God. You're still in fellowship with God. And it would appear that they, even though they couldn't be priests, they probably could still serve as Levites because under the law there were no restrictions on the Levites themselves uh, that they need to be needed to be physically perfect. So as we said, it only, it only stopped them from being priests, but they could still be in fellowship. They could still serve as Levites um, in service to God. Okay, the fifth principle, which is an important one, is, is to be teachers of God's word. And this is a very important one, and it's mentioned here in Leviticus 10, verses 10 to 11, where it says that, about the priests that you might be put a difference between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean, that you might teach the children of Israel all the statutes which Yahweh has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. And also... Malachi chapter 2 verse 7 for the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of Yahweh of armies so the priests along with the tribe of Levi were to teach the people about God's laws and precepts this was a very important responsibility they had to make sure they understood the word of God before they taught it to others and the Levites were scattered throughout the 48 Levitical cities, throughout the land of Israel. And this was done so that everyone could be near uh, the teachers of God's laws. And we all have that responsibility today about teaching God's word. It's not just the responsibility of brethren who speak on the platform or at Bible classes, but we can teach the ch our children the truth. We can teach our families the truth when we do the daily readings, the daily Bible readings. We can be teachers at Sunday school. We can talk to interested friends and neighbours about the truth. All these are teaching activities. And all of us need to be teachers of God's word because we will all be teachers in the kingdom when we are priests in the kingdom. So we need to do that now so then we can do that in the kingdom as well. Okay, the, the sixth principle, which is to be a compassionate and merciful high priest. And we just read that here from um, Leviticus 10, sorry, Leviticus 19, verse 18. It says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. I am Yahweh. Now, why Leviticus doesn't specifically tell us that the high priest had to be compassionate and merciful the general principle of compassion, showing compassion and mercy and love is found there in the book. That verse that we read is applies to all people, that we must love our neighbours as ourselves. And the priests and the people were to be compassionate to each other. But when we come to the uh, New Testament, the Apostle Paul tells us that the high priests had to be compassionate 
So we've got here reading from uh, Hebrews 5, verses 1 to 2, which says, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he might both offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those that are ignorant and astray, since he himself also is subject to weakness. So here we have the Apostle Paul telling us that the high priest was to have compassion on those that are ignorant and those that you know, went astray, remembering that he himself, the high priest, was subject to the weakness of mortality and the proneness to sin. And so we have here that this final principle of priesthood, to show compassion to others. And again, that's something that we need to do today in our lives to show compassion, especially when people do go astray, to try to bring them back. And when people fail in weakness, we need to try to have compassion on them and help them to come back to the truth. And we know, of course, that the perfect, compassionate and merciful high priest is Jesus Christ. And we've got here a couple of ver verses from Hebrews where the Apostle Paul tells us how Jesus was that compassionate, faithful and merciful high priest. In Hebrews 2, verses 17 to 18, he says, Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto us, his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God and to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that himself has suffered being tempted, he is also able to aid them that are tempted. And Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16 Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to, to help in time of need. So here... We, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ was a, that perfect high priest and he was so compassionate because he knew what it was like to be a man. He was a mortal man once and he had our own human nature with a proneness to sin, which he had to fight against. He knew that he had to fight against weakness and against sin, the struggle against sin, and he did that. And he also experienced great mental and physical suffering on the cross. He had to go through all that as well, which we don't go through that much suffering generally. And so Jesus Christ can sympathise with us. He is the high priest there that is ready uh, to help us. Now, let's, let's just say a, a couple of words about the Nazarite. Um, the Nazarite's not mentioned in Leviticus, but it's mentioned in um, the book of Numbers. So what was the purpose of a Nazarite? Well, the Nazarite vow, which is found in Numbers, um, the purpose of it was to give an opportunity for men and even women to imitate the high priest for a period of time. And so it was an opportunity for people to be uh, mimics or to be like the high priest as much as possible. So they were encouraged to be like the high priest, uh, to be part of that kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And we'll just have a look at some of the similarities of how the Nazarite vow um, mimicked the high priest. So in Leviticus 10 verse 9, we know that the high priest was not to drink wine or strong drink. And the same applied to the Nazarite vow. The Nazarite for a period of time he was not allowed to drink wine and strong drink. It also says about the high priest that he had the crown of anointing oil upon of his God was upon him. He also had that the crown, which we saw uh, early on, that golden crown on his forehead, which said holiness to Yahweh. And we know from the Nazarite vow that he wasn't to cut his hair or his or her hair during the time of his vow. So again, that represented that same crown of the high priest, that he was to show holiness in his thinking. Finally, um, 
as we read earlier, that the high priest was not to defile himself with any of the dead body or for his mother or his father. And it says the same thing about the Nazarite. He shall come at no dead body. So once again, the Nazarite was not to be associated with death and corruption. So again, we can see those parallels of if you take a Nazarite vow, you were, for a period of time, you were to mimic and to be like the high priest in your conduct. Now, there's another interesting um, comparison, this time not with a um, not with a Nazarite, but with, with a leper that's healed. I think we talked about this briefly when we did let the study on leprosy. But what was interesting is that when a leper was healed and after he was presented himself to the priest, he was really welcomed back to the nation. As we saw earlier, Israel was to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And the procedure of his return uh, back to, to the nation followed closely on how the high priest and the other high priests were consecrated into their office. Um, I'm not going to read out the verses, but you can see them on the screen there. So both the high priest, when he was inaugurated, as well as the other priests, and the leper that was healed, they had to offer a sacrifice and put the blood of the sacrifice upon their right ear, their right thumb, and their right, right toe. And not only that, but both had anointing oil to be poured upon their head, upon Aaron's head, the high priest as well as the healed leper. So we can see here that, again, the leper that was healed was welcomed back as a priest, a type of the priest, back into the, into the nation. And he had to behave like a priest when he was healed. He was back, back in that kingdom of, of priests. Now, the, the apostle Peter tells us, as we have already intimated in our class, that we are to be priests now. In 1 Peter 2, verse 5, um, Peter says, you are also living stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So we saw earlier in that one of our first slides how that quote from Exodus 19 showed that God wanted the nation of Israel to be a kingdom of priests as an example to the Gentile na nations round about them. So the apostle Peter picks up that same idea and quoting from Exodus 19, and applies it to believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's us. So we are to be a living priesthood now. We are to exhibit those, those principles which we saw earlier on, and hopefully people will see our example and be brought into the truth and be encouraged by how we behave. And again, this is all what we're doing now, is we're trying to be priests now, in, our, in those principles, because we have we are going to be priests in the kingdom. In those very um, familiar words in Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10, it says, And they sung a new, a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. So we are to be kings and priests in the future, but we need to behave as priests now. We are, as it were, priests in training now so that we can be priests in the future. This is our time of probation or of training now. So finally, what about the mortal Jews in the kingdom? As we said earlier, God's purpose with Israel, with the Jews, was that they were to be a, a kingdom of priests leading Gentiles to the knowledge of God. And as a nation and as a people, they failed in the past. We can see them today also. If you look at the Jews and the nation of Israel today, they're just as bad morally as any of the other nations of the Western world. They're not much better. Um, so they have failed in the past to exhibit God's purpose with them. But does that mean God's purpose with Israel has failed? No, because there are many verses, and we're going to look at some now, which show that Israel of the future, or the Jews of the future, will be take up the role of priests 
and Levites as mortals in the kingdom and help the Gentiles come back to God. So we've got there on uh, on the screen a verse there from Levitic sorry from Isaiah 66 verse 21 which says I will take of them for priests and for Levites says Yahweh. So again he's talking about the mortal Jews in the time of the kingdom that they're going to be taken for priests and Levites in service to God. In Isaiah 61 verse 6 again it says but ye shall be named the priests of Yahweh uh, men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. So again, it tells us here that the mortal Jews in the kingdom will be priests to God and they will help the Gentiles to their God. Ezekiel 44 verse 15, which says, which is talking about the temple, the, the temple um, in the future age. It says there, but the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, they that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me. So once again, during the time of the new temple, under uh, as described in Ezekiel, the last part of Ezekiel's prophecy, Levites and, and, um, uh, and the mortal Jews will be Levites and priests to God and they will serve in the temple. And finally, we've also got Zechariah 8, verse 22, verse 23, which again shows us the link between the Jews bringing the Gentiles to God. And Zechariah 8, verse 22, 23 says, Thus says the Lord of, of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold of all languages of all the nations, even they shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you for we have heard that God is with you. So here we can see that the Jews, again, in the kingdom age, will, will be, uh, the, the Gentiles will seek out the mortal Jews to, to lead them to God. As it says there, that they will be taking hold of the skirt of a Jew, saying, we have heard that God's with you. Please teach us about the things of God. So, of course, the Jews will have to first be converted, won't they, before all this happens. The Jews need to be purged. They need to recognize Jesus as the Messiah and they need to be taught the things of God. But they will have a purpose with uh, in, in the kingdom age to bring back and to lead the Gentiles to God. And that will be their role in that time. They will be the chief of the nations. So as we come now to a, a close of our class, let's just look at some of the um, those six principles to remind us of the principles of priesthood, which we need to show in our lives. So we need to show these six principles of priesthood. One, holiness. We need to be holy. We need to be able to discern clean and unclean, holy and unholy, right and wrong from the word of God. We need to live an immortal life now. We need to not be associated with corruption but we need to walk in the newness of life. Number three, we need to make ourselves ready to be that spotless bride for Christ. Now is the time for us to be ready before Christ comes. We need to be seek to be morally perfect. As Jesus said, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And we need to be teachers of God's word. Now, of course, to be teachers, we need also to be familiar with God's word, don't we? We need to have a, no a good knowledge of it and of its first principles. But we can all be teachers, not just the brethren. All of us can teach others about God's word because that's what we're doing in the kingdom. And finally, we know, know that the high priest and the priest had to show compassion to others. And that's what we need to show compassion and to help others uh, in our walk towards the kingdom. We, need, we all need each other's support as we strive in this difficult world uh, to seek and to be ready for the Master's return.